But what I like about a movie like Pan's Labyrinth is it makes that hard and fast distinction untenable. In that it makes those, it, it brings to light those moments where different worlds, different ways of describing worlds overlap. And they don't overlap neatly. And it's that messiness that, that makes me sort of go back to watching this film over and over and over again. You are listening to the Down the Wormhole podcast, exploring the strange and fascinating relationship between science and religion. This week, our hosts are Kendra Holtmore, PhD student at Boston University. And one of my coping mechanisms during this pandemic is to play the board game called Pandemic. Ian Benz, associate professor of elementary science education at UNC Charlotte. And one of my favorite coping strategies is actually reading a book called 10% Happier by Dan Harris. And it's about his journey to learning about meditation. Zach Jackson, UCC pastor in Reading, Pennsylvania. And it is worth noting that we are recording this on March 26th. So for many of us, we are just in week two of this. And this episode won't be released for another two weeks. And so by the point that it is, these answers may or may not have changed and we may or may not have descended into total anarchy and chaos and <laughs> marking on and there may be zombies walking the streets and we don't know any of these things. So um, as I'm editing this in the future, maybe I'll, I'll say something, but currently my, my favorite coping <laughs> strategy is not coping at all. I'm going nuts over here. My children are not happy. They want to be with people and it's been cold and rainy and we can't go outside and they're tired of watching the same things and they're tormenting my dogs. And I, 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 I don't You're know. You're being realistic. Uh, so, so my name is Adam Pryor. Uh, I am a teacher at Bethany College in Lindsborg, Kansas. And my favorite pandemic coping mechanism has been starting to watch Star Trek The Next Generation with my children who are six and nine. So with the CBS All Access, we've been watching old, like, because you have, you have all of the Star Trek TNG, which we put on oh. sort of on a lark. And my son is like hooked, like deeply hooked. Also, there is a ton of sexual innuendo in the first season that just goes right over their heads. And it is oh, hilarious yeah? to watch. <laughs> I also, I forgot that that, that was part of it. So you started pre-beard. You're going right, right from the yes. beginning. Okay. Yeah, right from the beginning. We went, we went right to the beginning. Yeah. So like the second episode is where they all get like this disease that makes them feel like they're drunk and they behave inappropriately, and they were really confused about what was going on, but were immediately able to link what was happening to the coronavirus because if you touch somebody, that was how you got it. So turns oh, out it was also a PSA. Oh. I didn't know that. <laughs> So they're learning the lot. The gift that keeps on giving. That was my my parenting success and or possibly failure of the day. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of both. Uh, a little of both. Um, so when we when we got started, we were talking about um, we we were talking about which movies, which pieces of science fiction we think about or that come to mind. Uh, when we're talking about religion and science, and I think everyone else chose some sort of very explicitly science fiction film, and I chose Pan's Labyrinth, mm -hmm. which I think to call that science fiction would be a stretch. Um, I'd call it magical realism, but I I thought about this movie in part because I I teach this movie a lot to students, and part of what I want them to to take away is to, to think about what constitutes things that are real. Um, and so when I teach this movie, I teach it sort of on the back end or in conjunction with sometimes before, sometimes after a unit on science and religion. And so this becomes either their way of sort of thinking about what that's meant or sort of introducing what, what's going to come. And so I have this uh, quote from Stephen Hunt um, that I usually, that I, that I give to students sometimes too. And it's talking about the, what's the same or different about science and magic. And this is what sort of makes me think about this, 
this movie in particular when I think about science and religion, right? So Stephen Hunt wrote Court of the Air, and the quote goes like this. A fantasy author creates a monster by having a character in robes of any color mumbling a spell, whereas the rules clearly state a science fiction writer has to put the character in white robes only and have them mumbling something about genetic engineering and how a termination of protein synthesis type 1 release factors promote hydrolysis of the peptidyl transfer RNA connection in reaction to recognition (laughs) of a stop condom. For the average reader, though, these both seem equally magic. Um, and I think this is part of what makes me me think about Pan's Labyrinth so much, is that it blurs this sense of reality for us. And when I think about religion and science, a lot of what I think about are the ways in which both of these traditions of thinking, both of these ways of thinking, blur the reality for us in ways that are both confusing and helpful and sometimes overlapping and sometimes not. So part of what I really like about this movie is that even though it's not explicitly about science, I think it's about the things that we do with religion and science all the time, um, about how we decide what is or isn't real to us. So I guess my, my, my sort of question is like one, I, I'm assuming everybody like watched the movie or saw it. Um, so I'm wondering yes. if I'm like way out in left field. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I have to watch it, I had to read along as we went. Oh yeah. Right. It's not in English. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And I like the movie. I'm just saying I was kind of like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, carry on. Sorry. Sorry. No. <laughs> so, so, so I <laughs> I, I, one of my, one of my questions is, is, um, the magical reality that's part of Pan's Labyrinth. And I feel like people react to that in different, different ways. And people react to this idea about, um, is magic real in different ways? So I'm curious what you all think, right? When, when you think of magic, is that something real for you or is it just like a set of illusions? Magic is kind of just a catch all term. Right, for something that is beyond uh, understanding, I, 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 when people talk about magic, I, I tend to zone out a little bit unless they're <laughs> using it metaphorically or talking about uh, like magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> if they're talking about card tricks, you're on board. Sure, it's a, it's a different way of using it then. It, it's it's like how wrestling isn't really wrestling. It's it's a it's a show, you know. Card tricks aren't really magic. It's a show. It's a magic show. You're pretending to do magic because magic isn't really a thing. But if you, uh, what is it, Isaac Asimov? Yeah, said yeah. that any sufficiently advanced technology um, is indistinguishable from magic. They they did some really interesting stuff with um this past two seasons of doctor who when they finally introduced a female doctor and the the absurdity of a time traveling hero suddenly comes into light because there's so many places in history where a woman would not be allowed to be and would not be allowed to be in charge and would not be allowed to uh to be taken as an authority and all of these all these deals and in in one they're in this this uh Kind of in the era of witch hunts and she's got her sonic screwdriver which every doctor has it but suddenly it's like a magic wand and it makes noises and there's a light and magic things happen and they call her a witch and they try to kill her so are you suggesting then that the uh, magic from the wizarding world of harry potter and then the magic in star wars is not real there is a character in harry potter who is reading uh, a brief history of time in um in what's that bar or whatever the place is outside of Hogwarts. Hogsmeade. Hogsmeade? Yeah. Hogsmeade? He's he's reading a copy of the brief history of time. And he is three <laughs> is that the three twirling words? his spoon with his finger. Yes. Um like above it, which I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but magic that is used without a wand is apparently like the highest form of magic and is almost impossible. And so he's not only a reading a book of science, but he's doing a just casual act of magic that is above and beyond anything that anyone else is able to do. And 
I would posit that is because he understands that magic in the Harry Potter world is simply a, a tapping into some higher state of physics. And so he has broken into that and is understanding it at a deeper, more logical scientific level. And so he is the the true hero okay. of the whole thing. <laughs> okay, I can, I can get on board. Know Potter Potter again. <laughs> okay, I know. There's my fan. What theory. movie did that happen in? That I don't first. remember. It was a, it was one of the early ones, I think. Uh, it's in the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay, sorry. Go go ahead. Yeah, I I like this question because I was reading um, a couple of articles about how how people interpret Pan's Labyrinth as having either these two inter or uh, these two overlapping worlds of uh, like Ophelia's magical world versus the background of the, the like political drama of the movie um, or whether she's just a little kid who is trying to make sense of this like dark world that she's living in. And I, I don't know. I think so to answer the question with regards to the movie, because I'm not sure if you were really asking Adam, like us personally or about the movie or maybe both, but I'm going to answer for both. <laughs> it's always both. Uh, I think the the movie, it seems like uh, the way it, most of the scenes are shot is that it wants you to believe in the overlapping realities. That's how I would interpret it. And the, it's a both and situation where like the the fawn is a real character in the film but those like magical creatures that Ophelia is interacting with are also ways in which she is learning how to become a functioning human in the real world and that it it's just like I don't know I guess you could describe it as uh, just another layer of like a social reality, like the social realities that we live. They're not really that real either. Like we decide that like money is valuable and that uh, we have all these different ways to like categorize people and our abilities. And we abide by these rules as if they're like written in stone, but they're not. We just have these different cultures that, you know, uh, give us norms and we live as if those norms are etched into the fabric of the universe. And so I think in a similar way, I feel that those social realities that we live in can be very similar to the way that uh, magic is written into the storytelling of films, like uh, it, especially in the magical realism genre. And that in Pan's Labyrinth, this uh, reality of Ophelia, even though nobody else interacts with this reality of the magical creatures and the labyrinth, nobody else sees that, but it's so real for Ophelia that it uh, informs her decision making and informs the person that she is. And in that sense, it's real. So I don't know, there's just this like weird fluidity for me between reality and magic in film that I think also translates. Uh, in like our lives as well, like the way that I see magic being used as a term, whether it's like a uh, sort of tongue in cheek or whether people are actually, you know, performing magical rituals and spells and doing, you know, all the, the things that you can do from like, whether it's like inside your religious tradition or you are dabbling in new age things uh those whatever you call magical is just like another way to work through life as a human and for some people like I almost think it doesn't really matter whether you think that is actually etched into the fabric of the universe it's a tool that you're using to inform your decision making and in that sense it functions like a social reality if that makes sense I think what I just said makes sense but I don't know <laughs> You 
you mentioned that nobody else interacts with the magical world but her. But I, I think he goes he goes a step further that nobody even sees it. Like the mandrake under the bed um, to her is this like the mythical mandrake, the screaming little monster. But a to, cute little creature. Yeah, but that. to her stepfather, it's it's just a it's a dirty root in old milk and it's not alive or, you know, towards the end when she is talking with the fawn while holding the baby, they're right there with her and sees her just talking to the air. Like the, the filmmaker makes it clear though. He says later in interviews, they asked him if, if all of that fantasy stuff is real. And he says, I think it is, but it should be left up to the person who watches whether they think it is. Um, which on a side note, when when directors and writers and whatnot tell me what they intended and then they say but you know whatever you want is fine too I, that always makes me a little annoyed and that's probably just me wanting the, the way that my brain works where it's like i want i want to know the way this was intended i want to know the answer i want i i want to know the one thing and not like your interpretation um like god hands down the torah and says um yeah but you know i do what you want with it too i mean yeah however it is you know, that that's that's not quite how it works, though. Um, Rachel's not here to tell me that that's exactly how it works. But anyway, so it seems to me the way he made the movie was that <laughs> this was all in her head. Like this was a snuffleupagus kind of situation where it was just imaginary world of a girl trying to make sense of the horrors around her and to put herself yeah. in the position of the heroine. And, and but then. In his interviews, it seems to be that um, it's more like, um, oh, more like like Hook, where the magic is real. You just have to believe in it first, and then you can see it. And I don't, yeah, I, I don't know where I come down on that. Well, to me, when you talk about especially the scene near the end where this she's talking to the fawn. And the stepfather comes running into the labyrinth and he can't see who she's talking to. Like, I wonder to me, it, you know, I started thinking about the fact that, that you could, could you argue that that's like a representation of childhood versus adults, right? That, you know, we talk about children and when you know, have such a great um, imagination um, and that, you know, that's just kind of pushed out of us. And as we get older, and we have a harder time imagining things like children or like we were when we were children. And so that made me wonder too, that I think it would have been interesting, not that they would have done this, but I'm wondering if the baby could have seen him. Like if that had anything to do with it about the childhood imagination, like I do wonder, did the baby see him? I mean, it's to me, one of the most interesting parts of the film is the sort of like last line, like the epilogue, where it's clear that like Ophelia is Princess Moana and everything is great. Um, right. And there's this, there's this last little bit, right. Where it, it talks about um, that there are traces of her time on earth, but only the, it's only visible to those who know where to look. And that there's this sort of, for me, right. As I'm, as I'm watching the film, right. There's this, this sense of, uh, in a certain way, like that the the reality or not reality of these events with the monsters kind of doesn't matter if you're depending on how you want to look at it, right? To me, it's it's some of the brilliance of the film is that <clears throat> however it is that you want to look at whether this is some way that she's coping with what's going on around her or that it's real, right? There's a way to interpret the film that allows you to make sense of it. And there's something brilliant to me about that, um, that you can make a really, and so like part of what I like trying to do with students is make them make a really robust case for whichever sort of version they want to interpret it as. But to, to let it stand out there that you really can make a case either way is fascinating to me. And I think that's part of what makes me think about religion and science, right? I, I know we've talked a lot in different episodes about noma right these non-overlapping magisteria yeah that that science does things over here 
sorry, I'm using hand motions, which doesn't help for anybody <laughs> listening. Science does things in its sort of realm of describing things. Religion does things in its realm of describing things. Those things don't necessarily have to touch. And bada bing, bada boom, you don't have conflict anymore. But what I like about a movie like Pan's Labyrinth is it makes that hard and fast distinction untenable. And that it makes those, it, it brings to light those moments where different worlds, different ways of describing worlds overlap and they don't overlap neatly. And it's that messiness that I really, that, that makes me sort of go back to watching this film over and over and over again. Um, so, okay. So I asked you about magic, right? Wait, hold on. Wait, okay. hold on. You said you watched this movie over and over and over again. Yeah. I think I end up watching this movie at least like once or twice a year. Okay. I just, I know it tells you a lot about me. Like I said, it's a, it's a very interesting movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's not uh, bad. <laughs> so, um, so, so I asked about, I, I asked you all about magic, but I'm, so now, now I want to put a little finer point on it. And I'm just curious. Um, do you think, do you think science is magic? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need to unpack that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Turns out we all agree. Uh, no. Um, so uh, like part of what I wonder, right, is that we, we tend to name anything that we don't totally understand as magic. Right. Uh -huh. And yet for the most part, I do not really understand what scientists are doing. I mean, I kind of do, but not with a great deal of depth. And so there's a little bit that I, that opening quote, right. From, from Stephen Hunt that for the average reader, you know, magic or science is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I, I wonder about that a lot because it resonates for me. There are still things in the scientific world that for all intents and purposes are just magic to me <laughs> and i don't think that's bad and i think that's the piece that i i find myself like i think people sometimes when i say that people are like oh yeah he's just doing his usual humanities thing yada 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 he's playing <laughs> with words but that's not really what i'm doing like i i actually mean that in a really like positive sense like i think there's something about calling science magic that's really powerful so I'm thinking about uh, Greta, right? My daughter. So uh, not too long ago, right? She got this slime kit that she really, really wanted. Um, it was like a birthday gift. I was, I was not in favor of this because it was just going to make a giant mess in the bathroom. But she was totally on board and really into it. Um, and it came with like all of the gear to be a quote unquote scientist, right? So it came with like lab goggles and like a little mask and a pipette and a dish to to do all of your slime experiments in right and it, along with all of the the little experiments it came with explanations of how it was that these polymers were sort of setting up such that they made slime right so it was like basically like huh. baby chemistry <laughs> and as much as she was interested in the explanation right there was something about actually understanding how it worked that made it less interesting, which I, I was totally surprised by. I thought like the more like she knew about it, like the more she'd sort of like be like, yeah. And it was, it was almost like it had the opposite effect. Like there was something about the magic of the reality of understanding how it worked behind it that made it inherently, inherently less fun. And so I, I think about this a lot because I, I feel like we really press people to say like science. Yes. We'll get all sorts of answers. And I wonder, is there something about like that message? That's a little dangerous that like when we lose that idea that science performs magic, it loses some of its cultural cachet. Wait. So to just make sure I'm understanding what you're saying, the what's dangerous is not leaving space to describe science as like mysterious or magical. Yeah. And 
what could you say a little bit more about what you think is dangerous about about that? that? Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, oh, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll use another example too. Cause I, I don't know. I, I always think in examples, right? So I was teaching a class in January about the stuff that I write about. And there were a couple of science students who were in the class, a biology major and, and a, a math major, and then a, um, a chemistry major as well. And we were talking about that there's this sort of notion, right? When they got into actually doing the work of science in the lab, starting to to sort of like really work through the processes of designing experiment and in, in, in the, the hard work that bench lab science is, that there's this almost tendency to forget what sort of inspired them to move in that direction in the first place. And the way they talked about it, it was almost like they had lost this sense of wonder at the world that sort of drove them to ask these deepening questions, right? It becomes this, this grind where you like, you, you suddenly lose your enchantment with the thing that you've thrown yourself into studying. And so there's, there's this part of me that I'm like, where, where do you find that space to hold on to the magic that science opens up for us. Like that, that is a big worry for me. Studying religion did that to me my first couple of years of college. I think I mentioned in one of the first episodes that to me, there was always this, uh, I, I think I, I, I saw pastors as wizards, like the way that, the way that you would view Dumbledore or, or um, Gandalf who has this deep, wisdom who knows all things and can say these things that come from yoda yoda yeah well oh, yoda too maybe yoda i mean he's not a wizard he's but a space yoda wizard. has a lot of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> but i would hear pastors anyway, I'm sorry yeah i would hear pastors who would say um you know your bible will say this but the greek here says this, which also means that, and the subtext is this, that, and the other. And if you read it in this way, then you'll know, you'll see that it's actually talking about this entirely different thing. Uh, I grew up in a context where we were talking about the Bible code. Any of you remember the Bible code? Where if you take pieces of scripture and you line them up in a grid and you enter in a kind of algorithm where you do this letter and then over one, down one, over one, down one, you're spelling out different things and you can, um, there's like hidden things, uh, hi hidden predictions in scripture and that there's just the Bible is at the heart of all of the magic. That's, that's the great spell book that all of these aspiring wizards go off to school and they learn all the spells and the deep magic and then they graduate and they go out and, and they perform this great magic on Sunday morning. They pray for people and using the right words and the right connection to, to the divine and people are healed. They speak the deep wisdoms of the universe and they know the mind of God. And I went to school to study Greek and Hebrew and that was I became an ancient language major because I wanted to know what was at the heart of the spell book. And I, I even said, like, I want to get my Bible now and I'll get my theology in, in seminary because I want to know what it says first before I hear other people tell me what they think it means. And when I started learning and reading in the Greek and the Hebrew and realizing that it's just another BS language and it honestly, it, it kind of broke my heart. And it was freeing to an extent. And my, you know, my, for the first time in my life, I, I kind of allowed myself to be okay with the fact that I didn't, I don't, I didn't actually believe in a God at all. And I kind of thought the whole thing was just a fairy tale that got out of control. And when I found out that we don't even have the original and uh, the language itself is real squishy and the people who wrote it wrote it with like a second grade education and like it's not it's not good literature and uh it it lost a lot of its magic and then i remember i studied i took a class on the doctrine of the holy spirit because i grew up pentecostal 
and like all we talk about is the holy ghost and the holy ghost power and this that and the other and i was like great yeah i'm finally gonna understand the holy spirit and i'm gonna take this class and i understood so much less when i when i finished i just all i understood was that there's precious little in the bible at any point to describe some fundamental trinity and and especially less about the holy spirit as as a, a an independent person and i again what was intended to help me to learn the spell book more ended up just demystifying the whole thing even further it kind of like you go to Hogwarts to study magic because you got a letter from an owl. And when you get there, you find a movie set and you realize that there's strings and there's green screens. And oh, okay. Maybe it wasn't as magic, but everyone on set kinds of thinks that they're actually, it's actually happening. So it's like um, a, a Tropic Thunder sort of a situation. Yes. That's why, with like, you talk about that, you know, you, you when you, <laughs> this series is on cinema right in films and you know, the, there's a lot of ma you could argue magic in the production of films especially after you know when they have to add in the special effects and things like that that i always find it interesting that whenever i see you know whenever i have access to a film at home or anything and you're able to see the deleted scenes right that the deleted scenes that are finished and they just decided it did not add, so they removed it. I like seeing those. But in it, what made me think about this was your comment about Harry Potter. But the ones when you, when it's a deleted scene, but it's not finished, so it does, it's not polished, it doesn't have all the special effects to it. I hate seeing those because it takes away that magical feeling for me of what yeah. I just saw in the film. And you see Andy Serkis in a skin suit and with balls all over yeah. it, and you're like, that's not gone. <laughs> That's weird. I don't like. Yeah, this. that's so weird. <laughs> Those are some of my favorite memes, by the way, with like the big bad guy over here and then like a guy in a pink suit over here. Is it so yeah. absurd? Or like Avatar. I saw a deleted scene for that and how they made that and they're all running around stilts and stuff like that. And it's just like, man, that's weird. So. Well, so I will say one of the things that's compelling about and also um, what what made the difference between, say, the original Jurassic Park and the Jurassic World or even Jurassic Park 3 is the difference between using CG, you know, so computer graphics, versus costumes and puppetry. Because I can tell when it's, when it's computer generated and it bothers me and it takes me out of it when I can, when you kind of have that uncanny valley where it's, it's realistic, but it's also not. And, and it's, it's almost better when Yoda is a puppet than when Yoda is a computer generated back flipping green thing. Yeah. And this movie, I think did a lot of, of really interesting, just costume design where I almost bought the magic more because it seemed mm -hmm. more organic and less real. If that makes sense. If it were digital and it were all perfectly cleaned up and polished, then it would not have felt as real. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's something like interesting about the choices that are made uh, by the director Del Toro in this case, it, it, just in terms of, of what the effect on the viewer is by, I mean, that's heavy makeup, right, for the monsters. Um, it's, I, I mean, in terms of like the sheer cinema of it, there's something beautiful about like watching the yeah. costume design. I mean, horrible, but beautiful. Kendra, you look like you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, no, I just, I, I sympathize with a lot of what, uh, Zach has said, but there's also something about, like, I just keep thinking of the, f this, the phrase of like the second naivete, uh, yeah. and that, like, I don't know, that maybe wouldn't be the way that a lot of people would want to describe it, but I just think of myself also going through that period of having a sort of critical distance from 
things that I once took for granted uh, religiously. You know, you go to college and the magic of education, if you will, is that it just leaves you more confused uh, at the end of it when you thought you were going to be this like enlightened person. uh, And then you just like realize you don't actually know anything. Uh, So it's discouraging on many levels. Uh, And yet some of us stay and become PhD students and, you know, go on to become professors and uh, even people who felt discouraged by like uncovering the the secrets of biblical text still go on to be pastors. And I just think there's something about that fact coupled also with what we're talking about in Pan's Labyrinth, where uh, Ophelia can look at a mandrake and see this magical creature, where her stepfather looks at the mandrake and sees this like weird plant sitting in a bowl of milk. And I just think both of these experiences, it, it reminds me of when you're standing in a museum looking at a piece of abstract art, where you, depending on where you are in your life, Uh, you're going to look at that piece of art and see something different each time. Or you may see the same thing every time. But it's almost like there's this one layer of a piece of abstract art where there's the author's intention and the material conditions that allowed that piece of art to come into existence and hang on a wall in a museum. And there's that reality. But the maybe more important reality, I'm using that word (laughs) loosely, I guess, um, is the reality where people come and look at that piece of art and they feel inspired by it in different ways. And some people try consciously to impose meaning on art, an abstract piece of art. Like I can go to a museum and think about something that's bothering me that day and that's going to inform the way that I read this like blob on a canvas and think, oh, I see an angel giving me a piece of paper, like, you know, and maybe another day I look at it and it's like (laughs) a dog playing with a bone, you know, just, (laughs) it can be many different things. And I think that similarly, setting Pan's Labyrinth aside for the moment, we as humans go through these phases of being like more or less committed to our various social realities, whether that's religion or science. You may like go through a phase of doubting the scientific method or whatever it is. Um, I think that you still have to engage with those things. So the person who loses faith in God will find different ways to like come up with meaning that fills a gap that maybe was left by the fact that they no longer believe in like a supernatural theistic God. But now maybe they talk about mother nature and the underlying energy of the universe. Um, And similarly, I think like in Pan's Labyrinth, Ian mentioned earlier the, the scene at the end where Ophelia can see the fawn, but her stepfather cannot. And it just sort of seems like those characters like Ophelia needs to see those characters in a certain way and needs to see them interacting with her because she is young and like underdeveloped and doesn't have, she's like learning what values she wants to, I guess, imbibe to like become the person that she's going to be. Whereas the adults in the story, like maybe they're not seeing those characters because it's like not, it wouldn't be something that would be inspiring to them. They already feel they're like in a different place in life. So I do think it relates to this dichotomy between childhood and adulthood. But I think it's more than that. I think it's about like what people need in a moment. And I also realize that like the way that I'm just describing this, uh, like feeling motivated by like art or religion, or whatever, that's a sort of Protestant way of speaking. And I am Protestant. So I'm like fine with that. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I just think like that's the analogy that comes to mind is the like staring at a piece of abstract art. I don't know if that resonates with anybody else, but that's what it feels like to me. Are you saying that because I'm in a room full of abstract art right now? 
Can you, can you see all the pieces? Oh, you are, aren't you? Oh, from you my are, late aren't uncle. You? Wow. That I, there's five, six pieces in this room to deaden the sound. Is any of those uh, pieces, uh, does, do any of them have an angel giving me a piece of paper? <laughs> Very few of them ever had any actual uh, representations. They, he mm. painted with a palette knife um, towards the end of his life. He, he went on this, this big uh, oh. uh, sort of second, I, I, I hesitate to call it a career because he never made any money off of it, but to him it was mm. uh, uh, later in life before he passed away and painted with a palette knife, these vibrant colors that kind of look like they're melting off of the canvas because of the way that the, the, the technique of doing that, I'll put some, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, to, so people, it's hard to explain what art looks like. Um, but they've always been, uh, they, they always express a, a kind of emotion that I can't really articulate to me. So I've decorated my house with them for years. And I think it's 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 also kind of worth noting that there is a priest in this movie, right. like a, a religious leader, and he is not represented well. And, you know, some of that is del Toro is is a lapsed Catholic. That's what he calls himself. Um, he, but he says once Catholic, always a Catholic. And so it's always going to be in there. Um, but the, the the priest is at the table and the, the, they start talking about the about the the revolutionaries and and he says when they're talking about how they're going to kill the communist enemies he says god has already saved their souls what happens to their bodies well it hardly matters to him which is a line that by the way that while he was doing research for his movie the devil's backbone um found that that he found that exact quote from a, a priest that used to give prisoners last rites in a fascist concentration camp and would tell them to confess um, to confess everything because God doesn't care about their bodies. He's already saved your souls. And he thought that the, the priest complicity in all of the violence was just horrifying. And he made the, the pale man, that, that horrible creature with the eyes on his hands. He, he made that as symbolic of the Catholic church in his, in his uh, worldview, because it was sitting there at this feast, which it didn't want to touch. It just wanted to prey on the innocence of children instead of eating all that was before it. And his prejudice against the Catholic Church and organized religion in general, pretty, it's, it's not subtle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The church doesn't get played out real well in this movie if, if you haven't watched it. Um, but I, well, if you haven't watched it, you should not be listening to this. Episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, but I, I, I resonate with you, Kendra. Like, I, and I agree. It is like a very Protestant way of sort of describing um, what's mm -hmm. going on, but also as a Protestant, I'm okay with that. And I, I think one of the, the interesting things to me, I, I like the analogy to abstract art in, in part of what's interesting to me about the movie itself right is that like we've talked a lot about ophelia and and captain vidal right but there's also that like moment with mercedes mm. at the end of the movie the the housekeeper mm. and and i think what's what's interesting to me is that the way that when you're talking about like yes there's that level between like adults and children right but there's also this sort of way in which the how the world is magical and enchanted for ophelia I think changes Mercedes. And I think that's like this like crucial piece to what goes on in the movie that the, the ways in which the world is magical to us opens up is, is made meaningful bleeds into the lives of those who are around us. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm never quite sure what I want to do with that. But what I like about it and why it makes me think about religion and science is that it breaks down this idea that these can be separate things they're going to bleed into each other, right? Oh, when you like make that. meaning of a world, it's, it's going to overlap and you have to deal with the messiness of what that is. And, and so for me, I think what worries me, right? Like when I, when I tell like the story about like Greta being less interested because it's less magical, right? Is that I, I want science to enchant the world for her. Yeah. And I want that like deepened knowledge to lead back to like what Kendra was talking about, that second naivete, like how we make that move so that even after we, we know, quote unquote, we, we know more about these, these realities we're describing, 
they still have that magic for us so that we come back to it in some way. Because I, I, I don't know, I work with undergraduates a lot. So I see this process of their souls deadening when they, when they study something in depth, right? Like I, I, I watch the student who shows up in my class, like Zach showed up and then like, can't figure out why it is that this religion professor isn't just calling himself an atheist. Um, yeah. Right. And that, that, that that's really hard. Right. And, and I worry, I spend a lot of time worrying about like, how do I help people move into that second naivete? And, and I think it's really important. How do you help people move into that second naive? I I don't know. I I probably don't. I probably just drive them to a sense of <laughs> <laughs> I think I just drive them to a sense of existential despair. And then when they've hit rock bottom, maybe they come back. I, I got like a Jonathan Edwards style of teaching. <laughs> um <laughs> so so as as Zach already mentioned, right, we're in the middle of the end of week one of of pandemic y kinds of things and we've moved to all online education and I, I felt really bad because I'm teaching eighteenth and nineteenth century theology and so students are gonna read Fear and Trembling next, which seems like a particularly particularly rough text to have them do. And we're we're gonna talk about existential theology as like the next unit of the class. And so I was making my uh, my my lecture notes for the students, and you all can tell me if I've gone too far. Um, so the background of the Prezi that I have made for the students is a is an Albert Camus quote because that felt appropriate if we were going to do <laughs> existential theology. Um, so it says the literal meaning of life is whatever you're doing that prevents you from killing yourself. <laughs> Well, I just thought yeah. we'd go, we'd go On right now, I guess. Um, and really, really just sort of keep that in the background of your thinking, <laughs> right? So, when you ask me how it is that I re enchant the world, I'm probably not the right. Well, how about you, Kendra? Ask. Because you seem to have a pretty great <laughs> grasp on the magical and <laughs> the wonderful. I mean, I do love the magical, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't have a great answer to this question either. I will say that. I do think for some people, you have to hit the existential like rock bottom before you realize that it's like a necessity to build something from that rock bottom ground up. That <laughs> works for some. I don't want to advocate that as a position. No, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't want to advocate that either. But I do think that's just how it happens for some people, and I think that that's maybe the hardest way mm. to go about it uh but i don't my think teaching evals are so bad sometimes um i i i will say that like what i have observed in my interactions with undergraduate students and just reflecting on like my own experience i think what really helps people to have a uh, a less existentially heavy uh, path forward towards re-enchantment is having like good questions to ask about the world and about the things you're learning. Um, because it's one thing to study physics or to study, you know, 19th century theology and just like regurgitate that information but it's something entirely different to learn those things for the purpose of solving a problem that is like nagging you or like learning those things because like you want to learn physics because you're really curious about like gravity or something in the universe that requires this like baseline knowledge and the really creative and life-giving part of the knowledge that we imbibe is the way that we use that knowledge. And so I think that the 
like re-enchantment, I think is really tied up for me with creativity. And as a teacher and like as someone who hopes to be a, a professor for undergraduate students one day, I always think about like, how can I best communicate information and make it clear that like you do have to regurgitate this on a test, but that that's never my goal. Like I never want someone to just learn something because I'm telling them it's important. I want them to understand why it's important and how it can stir something in them that makes them creatively seek a solution to a problem or question that means something to them. And so I think that's when reenchantment becomes easier is when people feel like inspired to create and whether that's creating like a piece of art or like writing a novel or publishing a research paper where you've come up with this really interesting experimental study there are so many different outlets of creativity and i think those are the ways that people uh become like reenchanted with their work um and their education and their relationships with other people and like their own environment. And so yeah, I think the core of it is like creativity and also like curiosity is part of that too. Um, so I don't know if that is an adequate answer to your question, but that's how I would answer it. This has been episode 33 of the Down the Wormhole podcast. Thank you for your patience as we all kind of work out how to do this podcast with our crazy new lives. Quarantine has not been especially kind to clergy and academics, but we should be back to our regularly scheduled schedules by now or whatever that looks like. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can check out patreon.com slash down the wormhole podcast or just take a minute and share an episode with your friends on social media. You can find links to articles and further reading in the show notes or at our website at downthewormhole.com. Next week, I get to literally take you down the wormhole in one of my favorite movies of all time, Interstellar. Now, we could talk for weeks about the scientific and societal themes of this movie, but given the state of things, I'm particularly interested in the ways that we use film to process our fears of the apocalypse. So buckle up, friends. We are talking ancient apocalyptic literature, modern cataclysm, and why Adam thinks I'm totally wrong about the whole thing. But until then, I think there is one thing that we can all agree on. Wait, we definitely need more space wizards, by the way. <laughs>